Good morning. Glad that each of you are here on this beautiful day. And I'm glad that I'm here on such a beautiful day in the Lord's house and on Father's Day to boot. It's a great place to be. If you will, please take your hymnals. Let's turn to hymn number 10, O Worship the King. And if you will, stand and sing with us first, second, and fourth verses together. Let's now turn to 252 and let's sing Sweet, Sweet Spirit. I'm sorry. Come right on up then. <laughs> Hold on to that thought, please. We'll do that in a minute. Y'all can have a seat. It feels so good to be here and say this. Good morning. Good morning. I've missed you all. I'm glad to be back in Williams. Welcome everyone to Williams. Um, if you would grab your bulletins and look on with me. If you're visiting this morning, look at the end of your pew. There should be a slot, a little piece of paper area. And uh, there's a, a couple of questions on a sheet of paper that says welcome. And if you could just fill that out and turn it in in the offering plate, that would be great. First, we have an announcement from Handsome Les. Come on up here, Lester. Good morning. morning. Not sure about the handsome part, but <clears throat> as most of you probably know, uh, we've partnered with the Food Bank of Central Alabama to run a mobile food pantry once a month for the next year. Uh, we, we've done it uh, two months now, April and May. In those two months, we've, we've given out the equivalent of about 10,000 meals. Um, the next uh, food pantry is going to be this Friday, this coming Friday. If you're not part of that ministry and would like to be, uh, I have sign-up sign up sheets in the foyers. Uh, so put your name and phone number down. Or if, uh, if you want to call me directly and tell me, that's fine. Uh, uh, we do need some, some more volunteers. Everybody can't be here every Friday every, every time we do it, so we need to sort of switch out. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Les. All right, look with me. Some announcements I would like to tell you about or remind you about. Here are some things that are not in the bulletin, so listen up. Um, if you consider yourself a young adult, um, we're going to have a little get-together on July 1st that evening and go to dinner and a movie. And there will be more information to come in the bulletin next week, but just ponder this week if you are a young adult or not. Just think about that. Okay. All right. Now, Scotty is in need of you to go to him and put your name on the sign-up sheet for snack or smack this summer. So if you want the youth to come over, enjoy your food, enjoy your pool, um, we'll come over on a Sunday morning for smack or a Sunday night for snack. So you see him, get your name on the list. Next week, I would like to meet with the Children's Committee at 4 o'clock, so just put that down on your calendars. I'll remind you next week. And um, if you will look in the bulletin, here's an announcement that's in the bulletin. Look under Perry County Mission Trip. 
That is going to happen um, on the Saturday of July 30th, and there's some sign-up sheets if you're interested in being a part of that. So get your name on that sheet. But there's another project coming up very soon, actually this coming Saturday morning at 7 o'clock. You can meet here at the church, and there is someone in need of their house being painted, and I think we're pretty good at painting houses. We're pretty good at it. So come and be a part of that this Saturday at 7 o'clock. All right, and there's other things that you can read about that's important, so make sure you read them. All right, so now find someone that you have not hugged yet, that you have not kissed on the cheek or said good morning to. Ready? You found them? Stand up, go. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all here this morning, and we're glad to have Randall with us uh, this morning, uh, Pat's friend and Linnell's brother, so we're glad you're here this morning, um, worshiping with us. Um, just uh, as Nikki had mentioned there, you are aware of all those announcements we have, but it is so good to be, to be here with you this morning. It feels like it's been a while since we've had... Well, I'm not going to say since we had church. I hope you have church on a regular basis. But since we've had uh, what I call tie putting on church. And so, uh, but it is good to see you all here this morning. And as we begin our time together, let's begin with a word of prayer. <coughs> Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, as we are in this place this morning, <clears throat> as we've come to gather with family and friends there's sounds of laughter and joy and, and seeing folks we haven't maybe seen in a little while. God, we also come this morning with the news of this past week, the past few weeks, Lord, on our minds and on our hearts. And so we take time in this, this time we've set aside for worship to pray, God, for, for people who were affected by tragedy, to pray for our country pray for our world, but most of all, God, to pray that your Holy Spirit empowers us to be the presence that changes the world, and not simply the presence that points the finger at it. So God, be with us here in this time of worship. Lord, help us to, to lift up our hearts, our voices, our prayers. Bless, Lord, our, our offering of worship and praise this morning, and may your Holy Spirit be here speaking to us, stirring within our hearts, showing us, Lord, what it means to be more and more like you. It's in the name of Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Okay, our scripture call to worship this morning is uh, Psalms 22, 19 through 28. But you, O Lord, do not be far away. O my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen, you have rescued me. I will tell you your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. 
All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all of offspring of Israel. For he did not despair or arbor the affliction of the afflicted. He, he did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. My, may your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To God be the glory. Third time's a charm. <laughs> Isn't it great that we don't have to expect everything to go perfectly or we fall apart? We are so blessed that we know God is with us even when things don't go like we planned, which most days there's something that doesn't, isn't there? Let's take our hymnals now, please, and turn to 252, a wonderful hymn, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. Let's stand as we sing together, please. At this time, I believe our children are invited to come forward. Children are kind of big here, aren't they? Then? Come on down. Here we go. today is, other than it being Sunday? Father's Day. Yes, yes, y'all got it right. And on Father's Day, I get to thinking about my dad and how awesome of a dad he is. And how, and how much you love him. And how much I love him, yes. And how he's been there for me. But what I really like to remember are the funny times that I've had with my dad. <laughs> like when I was a little girl, y'all's age, when my dad was in a silly mood. Didn't matter if you were making a sandwich in the kitchen or watching television. The claw came out. And the claw was vicious. The claw knew every ticklish spot. So the claw would go for the side and tickle the side. Or the claw would go for the neck and tickle the neck. That's a tickle. Yes. yes. And then when you thought everything was safe and the claw was gone, the clamp came out. The clamp was even more vicious. 
it would go for the belly and get the ribs. And I would just laugh and giggle and sometimes scream for help until the claw and the clamp left. Those are some memories that I love with me and my dad. And I know you have similar memories too, don't you, with your dad, don't you? Well, you know what? There are some kids that don't have those moments to share. They don't have a dad or their dad's just not around a lot and they don't see him. But here's something cool. I have the Webster's Dictionary. I think it's 1975 edition. <laughs> Um, but it is a book of words, and it tells us what words mean. So under father, there are many definitions. One of the definitions is a father is a man who has a child, like our dads, right? Another definition is a father is an older man, and that's very true with my dad because he's very old. But y'all's dads are not. So. Okay. All right. And then the very last definition that I love the most is that a father can be a leader. Now, God is just so great because he puts some awesome men in our lives who love us, that we can look up to, and they help teach us and help us make the right decisions in life. But we don't call them dad. They're not the fathers that we take home with us, but they're just as important. And you know where to find those great men? Here in this church. Oh, yes. God. Look around. Look, look. Try to find some men. Some of them are your dads. Hey, Dad. Hey. Yeah. But some of them are not. We don't call them Dad. But they are pretty cool men. They're in our lives for a reason. So we're going to recognize all the men this morning. They're going to stand up, and you're going to help me give them a treat. Like our mothers, they got some sugary treats from Mad Hatter, and what? so will our fathers, too. They get a cupcake. Woo! Oh, yeah. So, Caroline's ready. It's wearing me out. It's wearing you out. It's wearing me out, too. All right, so, y'all ready to help me pass out the treats? Okay, so if all of our men, every man, has to stand up and receive a prize. And here y'all, y'all go. So Y'all go ahead and stand up. Our offertory hymn is 585, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. Let's stand together as we sing, please.
for this for this time. Lord, for this beautiful weather that you've sent us. Lord, for our, our fathers, for our leaders. Lord, we, we thank you for them. And Lord, for those um, that today is hard, we pray for them. Lord, we thank you for this church. Lord, and thank you for um, the blessings that you have given us. And just help us to use those blessings to give back to you in any way that we can. Help us think about what the with those ways that we can serve you. But we thank you and we love you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Stand and sing the doxology, please. Praise God.
Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the third chapter of Galatians. <coughs> Galatians chapter 3, we'll be reading verses 23 through 29. And I think, I think this time next year we're going to, in the offering plate, pass around lozenges too, because I'm like... <coughs> I hear some of y'all, I know it's not echoing amens, I know we're all just, <laughs> so, Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 23, reading through verse 29. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Holy God, in this time, as we listen, as we lean in to hear a word from you through the words of Scripture, May we hear your Holy Spirit speak to us in spite of whatever words I may lay in the way. God, help us to hear your voice. Help us to hear your calling. And help us, Lord, to obey. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, perhaps you've heard the story about the little boy who went on his first plane ride with his parents. The night before, he, he packed his bags, he, he, had, he had seen how it was done, he rolled all of his clothes up and tucked them down in the bag, even, even laid out his traveling clothes, you know, like he would wear them, like, you know, some people like me do, and you lay the shirt out, and then like you, like you lay down on the bed and then just vanished. There's the shirt and the pants. He even put his individual socks in each shoe. He wanted to be ready to go first thing in the morning. He didn't sleep well that night, though. He only thought about all the wonder and excitement that there was going to be on his first ride in an airplane. And when he got up in the morning, he went to the breakfast table and only ate one piece of toast, no butter, because someone had told him it was better to fly without a full stomach. I don't know if that's true. I don't go anywhere mostly with not a full stomach. But that's, that's free. That's not in the text. And so he got up that morning, he loaded his suitcase into the trunk of the car all by himself, found his place in the middle of the back seat with his mom and dad, and off to the airport he went. And everything, everything about the whole trip excited him, even the parking deck, as they went round and around and up and up until finally his dad found an empty spot. And as he was handed his suitcase, he said, Now, son, help me remember, we parked on the fourth, yellow, fourth level in the yellow zone, row F4. Can you remember that? Uh-huh. If he's like me, I pull my cell phone out and take a picture of it. But he lugged his bag all the way over to the elevator. They went down to the level for checking in. And there he was still. He was amazed. There were all these people uh, early in the morning from everywhere, all with their own suitcases, all with their own places to go. Even the security line was fascinating to him. He loved the idea of getting to take his shoes off in public while mom and dad groaned about it. And when they finally made it to their gate, he was glued to the window, watching as the planes were taxied from the landing strip up to their gate, and even more, watching them as they zoomed down the runway and sort of just magically lifted off on their way to somewhere far, far away in a great big hurry. It wasn't too long before their plane was at the gate. They made it down the jetway and into the plane to find their seats. And he said, Dad, I want to sit by the window. I can't miss anything. And he stared out that little porthole the entire time. He watched as the crew stowed the checked luggage. You know how they delicately do it. They grab it and throw it onto the plane. <laughs> and he watched 
as the ground began to move after that thud, when the taxi began to move it away and out toward the runway. And then he watched as he heard the engines spool up, as he heard that roar that sort of overtakes everything, and then that sudden thrust, and the ground moves faster and faster and faster until suddenly you can feel the front lift and then the whole thing, and you're in the air. And the ground got farther and farther away. His dad watched him the whole time as, as his son looked out the window. But once they had gotten up pretty high and been traveling for a while, he noticed his son wasn't nearly as excited as he had been all morning. He asked him, he said, son, is something wrong? And he turned around and sort of sunk down in the seat, stared at his shoes. He said, dad, there aren't any lines. The boy's father was a little confused. He said, son, what do you mean there aren't any lines? He said, you know, the lines that outline Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia. I don't even see where it says what state they are across them. I suppose when all you've ever seen of the country, all you've ever seen of the world is a flat map or a globe with lines drawn on it with names, words, labeling one state or one country from another, you might come to expect to see those lines and those labels from the window of an airplane. Isn't it something, though, that once we get high enough, once we or reach a certain altitude, once we, I don't know, see things perhaps from God's perspective, that the lines we've drawn and the labels we've made, they tend to disappear. Or better, and perhaps more truthfully, they were never there in the first place. <coughs> Reality is we've put those lines there. We created those labels. Lines to separate ourselves. Li labels to clearly say who's who and what's what. Some of those lines were, were drawn a long time ago. They're handed down to us from our ancestors. Lines drawn around ideologies, religion, ethnicity, rivers and mountains and streams. Some of the labels we use are also ancient ones, created in a time when we thought it beneficial to identify differences, to highlight possible threats, to make sure people were different from us, places different from us. Usually when we draw such lines, it's so we can put up walls, build fences, keep people out and say, this in here is mine, and that out there is yours, and you can't have what's mine, and I don't want what's yours unless I ask you and you ask me. We tend to label people for the same reason. These people are my people. And those people, well, they're not my people. In fact, it's a habit, I'm afraid, that is as old as humankind itself. And it's one that unfortunately didn't even die with the first generation of Christians. Not even with some of those who actually heard Jesus live and in person. We know because the Apostle Paul had to deal with this kind of line drawing, this kind of label making in much of his ministry, but specifically in his dealings with the church at Galatia. Because you see, it's there in Galatia that Paul had to deal with this group of legalistic fundamentalist Christians that some have called Judaizers. While they were followers of Christ and some of the first, they believed that every person, every person who wanted to be a Christian, had to first become a practicing Jew before they could be a real follower of Jesus. This meant a strict adherence to the law, to the Torah of the Hebrew Bible. That included dietary laws, laws about the Sabbath, laws concerning the cultic practices of the temple, ritualistic purity, how long your hair could be, what you could do on Saturday, those kinds of things. They also believed that in order to be a true follower of Christ, every man had to be circumcised. Now, can you imagine revival meetings for these people? Altar call comes, every man. I don't think they were full. I'm just saying. For Paul, this was ludicrous. This was insane. The, the, the whole of Paul's theology, his understanding of God in Christ, is founded in the grace of God. The unmerited, unearned salvation of Christ. The freely given eternal love of God. So to ascribe to the law, to be enslaved to the ancient practices of ritual sacrifice, laws concerning everything from the clothes you wear to the food you eat, flies, Paul says, in the face 
of God's grace. To the apostle, the demand to be a Jew first and then a Christian is absolutely absurd. And I happen to think so too. But to tell you the truth, I can understand it. I mean, really, I, I can. I can understand it. After all, how many of us want to be a part of some organization our whole lives, a part of something our whole lives, having worked to gain a certain level of respect, a certain level of recognition, having earned so much, only to have a crop of new folks come in and expect to be treated as equals? I can understand it. Drawing lines, labeling things, saying this is how it has to be if you want to be a part of this. This is mine, that is yours. After all, I can remember when my first, the first time my stepbrothers moved in, I went from one boy and one bed and one bedroom, which is enough, to four boys in one bed and one bedroom. And that's not enough. You better believe there was some line drawing and some label making going on then. Now, you can't play with that. That's only for Thomases. You can't play with this. This is only for LaBeoufs, which, by the way, if you didn't know, that's my step family's last name. And, and it, on and on, this drawer is mine. Those drawers are yours. You can't touch that. This one's mine. I can understand it, really. When you've been doing something the same way your whole life and now someone else comes in, no, you got to play by my rules. You got to get on board. I can understand it. To clearly point out the old rules to somebody who wants to join an established movement. I think that may have been a part of what was going on with Paul's opponents in Galatia. They were lifelong Jews, most of them. Maybe they were Gentile converts who had obeyed the laws, including that, and that tricky one. And it just didn't seem fair. It didn't seem fair for somebody to come along and say, God loves everybody now. Jesus has made a way for everybody else. And they don't have to obey the law. The law, the law isn't what makes you righteous. That doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair for others to join this Jesus movement without having to go through all the same things I've gone through. I can hear them. I can. It didn't seem fair to those folks for them to get the same benefits as me. But you know, we, we have a name for that. It's called grace. That's grace. To give one a pass. To forget about credentials and certifications of authenticity. Grace says, I may have been here longer than you. I may have earned more than you. I may, I may have been here more and done more than you, but come on in anyway. In fact, have a better seat than me. That's grace. Grace says there's no distinction based on age, experience, tenure, uh, salary, history. Anyone who comes is welcome. That's grace. But if we're honest, if I'm honest, grace, I don't like it a whole lot. I mean, grace is fine for me, right? I mean, uh, you, we know the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But grace for us, no, no, maybe for others. Let me get to know them first. Then, then maybe grace is for everybody. But grace peels back the labels, erases the lines we've attempted to draw, separating the worthy from the unworthy, the good from the bad, the sinner from the saint. However, when we start talking about the grace of God like that, when we start talking about the love of Christ like that, when we start talking about how God has erased all those labels we've made, when we start quoting words like Paul's verse 28, there's no longer Jew or Greek no longer slave nor free, no longer male or female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. When we start talking like that, especially in a day when folks get caught up in trying to make sure everybody obeys the labels they have, well, people start squirming a little bit. After all, those labels exist for a reason. Those lines were drawn for a reason, weren't they? And I'm sure, I'm sure Paul's opponents in Galatia made that argument. That in order to be heirs to Abraham's promise, the Bible says, the Bible says, I can hear them, that you have to follow Abraham's covenant. That you have to follow these laws that we've been following for centuries. 
I'm also pretty sure at the heart of their insistence on becoming a Jew first, there was a hope that maybe, just maybe, these Gentile converts, these slaves, these women, these sinners, these not like me at all kind of folks, would just give up and not want to be a part of the movement, not want to be around. Because, you know, if you don't want someone in your group, if you don't want someone around you in your circles, in your community, all you really have to do is make a few rules, make a few laws that they'll never be able to keep. You know, like voting tests and poll taxes. If you want to keep someone out, someone you don't want in, just make it really hard for them. Or better yet, if you're a religious person, use religion. I mean, it's, it's tailor-made for that stuff sometimes. At least you might feel a little bit better about yourself. At least you can blame it on something else. You could stand on street corners with signs printed with obscure biblical references, calling out the sins in communities of people you don't like. Or perhaps you could make a list of all the things, all the practices, all the required church services you have to attend, the proper way to be baptized, the right translation of the Bible to read, the proper percentage of your gross annual income in order to tithe, in order to be a proper Christian, all that kind of stuff. Maybe you could set down a list of all those things you find in Scripture that, require, uh, that are required of good, godly people. And then when other people can't live up to it, pat them on the head and say, that's okay, I'll pray for you. That'll keep them out. Or you could revert back to that most ancient practice, the one which Paul decries so directly in the text before us this morning. You could, as the Judaizers did, just start labeling people. It's not that hard, really. Just find a flaw, a characteristic, an orientation, an identity that another person has that you just find unsavory, unfit, or just downright unbearable, and call them that. Call it out. Call it out and name those who you claim to be are unworthy of Christ's love, unworthy of God's grace, unworthy of the salvation which you have so freely and unconditionally been given. Because the truth is, that's what, that's what we do. That's what I do. We label folks with words and titles. And then we say they aren't worthy. That the Bible says they're bound for hell. Or anywhere but the kingdom of God. But can I tell you something? Something I'm learning more and more as I walk with Jesus. As I listen to Jesus. We can create whatever labels we want. We can even conjure them up from the very pages of our King James Bibles, and we can place them on the heads of those we'd like to see left outside of God's kingdom. But every single time we do it, every single time we make a label and put it on someone else and say, because of that, they can't be in, every single time, God's grace peels the label right off. Every single time we try to limit the love of God by labeling someone as unworthy, as a heathen, as an abomination, as a reprobate, as a sinner, every single time the unconditional love of God rips the label right off and shows that beneath every label we try to make for ourselves or for one another, every time underneath those labels, under every attempt we have made to raise ourselves above someone else or to bring someone below us, under every label there is but one truth. Each and every one of us is a child of God, called to a life of faith and love through Jesus Christ. God's grace peels off the label and clothes us with Christ. And in the words of Paul, in Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. There is no longer yellow, brown, red, black, or white. There is no longer rich and poor. There is no longer, longer normal or different. 
There is no longer Democrat or Republican. There is no longer Protestant or Catholic, Baptist or Methodist. There is no longer us and them. For all of us, all of you, are one in Christ Jesus. The labels have been peeled off. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, we are so thankful, God, that in our own attempts, in my own attempts, to label others, God, that you always peel those labels off. I'm thankful, Lord, that you've seen past the ones I've given myself. Lord, I pray you help me to see past the ones I've given to others. And I pray that for all of us. Remind us, Lord, that even when others have given us labels of unworthiness, that your love has shown us that that is just not true. Help us, Lord, to remember that for others. Lord, this morning, help us to take the words of Scripture to heart. Help them to be real for us. Not just words we quote when they are convenient, but words that shape and change us more and more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus, our Lord. And so now, Holy Spirit, as we are here, as you speak to our hearts, as you stir in our presence, Help us, God, to make whatever decisions we need to make, whether privately in our own lives, publicly before this congregation, but, Lord, to you. Give us the strength and courage to make them, to be people in the image of Christ. Be with us now, we pray, in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Our invitation hymn is 446, I Will Serve Thee. you go out from this place, may you take the words that we have heard this morning with you, the words of Holy Scripture, the words of the Apostle Paul breathed by the Holy Spirit. And as you go out, as you attempt maybe the temptation to label someone, may the Holy Spirit move in you to rip the labels others have put on them first. Let us pray together. Lord Christ, go with us from this place. Help us to see each and every one who crosses our paths as a child of God and therefore our brother and our sister. Help us, Lord, to love them and to show them your love. In Christ's name, amen.